Jackson will talk to us about uh, methane over precious metal catalyst in the first stage of gas to liquid conversion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's somewhat to follow after that, I must admit. I'm glad I'm looking at methane and not CO2. <laughs> so, um, let me start off by uh, acknowledging my co-workers, Mark Files and Phil Ingram at Johnson Marthy. Elena Parra was the graduate student who did uh, uh, most of this work. So we're going to start with methane. Obviously we can steam reform it. And currently we would normally take over nickel catalysts and we'd get a mixture of CO, CO2 and hydrogen. And typically we could use that for methanol synthesis. But if we want CO and hydrogen for fissure troughs, then it's not at all clear that you really want to use nickel. In fact, we're probably going to want to use precious metal catalysts. And apart from the talk we've just heard, the literature is not exactly full of information about what happens with reactions of methane over precious metal catalysts. One of the things that does happen is there's carbon deposition. We've got the methane tracking reaction. And if you start to do steam reforming or dry reforming, then these other reactions also begin to play a part. And if we look at thermodynamics, you can see that by the time you get up to these kind of temperatures where we're doing uh, the reactions, this is the Kelvin, so if we're working up here in this area, then methane cracking is now becoming the main carbon deposition uh, process. So we're going to look at two catalysts. We will look at platinum alumina and a rhodium alumina. They're prepared by a standard method from either chloroplatinic or rhodium nitrate. They're calcined. We're using about 0.2% metal. Uh, the dispersion's just less than 4% for the rhodium and nearly 18% for the platinum. Now we're going to look uh, at two different sets of studies, uh, pulse studies and continuous flow. The pulse studies uh, are done at one atmosphere and the continuous flow studies are done at 20 bar. <laughs> so we're going to look at sort of pressure effects and we're also going to look at time effects here as well because the pulse studies are going to look at the first few seconds of catalyst life and the continuous flow studies are going to look at the catalyst over the course of at least an hour. So if we start off with the pulse studies, we're going to reduce the catalyst to 873, and in fact that's the temperature of reaction for all of the results that I'm going to show you today. We're going to purge with helium, and then into uh, a helium carrier, we're going to put pulses uh, of methane. Now let me say right at the beginning that there's no reaction over the support. If you put the methane over the support material, nothing much happens. If we put it over the catalysts, then you see this uh, the red here is the conversion, percentage conversion of methane over the rhodium. The yellow sitting behind it is the uh, amount of hydrogen produced. And then the same for the platinum, which is the green, and the hydrogen that's evolved. Uh, in the blue. So you can see there's a fair um, amount of con uh, conversion, about 50 odd percent, and you, as you might expect, it starts to decay. Not as fast as you might expect, though. Uh, this is still quite reasonable activity. But how much carbon is that actually laying down? Well, we can do quite an accurate measure for each of the pulses, and we can look at the carbon to metal ratio. And this is looking at carbon to the number of actual surface sites we have available uh, as measured by CO chem absorption or hydrogen chem absorption. And if you look at pulse one for rhodium and pulse one for platinum, we see we've already got a ratio of 70 carbon atoms to every metal on the surface. 
And for platinum, it's, it's just half that, uh, about 32. By the time we reach pulse 5, we have now got uh, considerably larger numbers. And of course, we can probably assume that this is not all sitting on the metal. Now, if it was a nickel catalyst, uh, as we've just seen, then we would be going through this sort of process where we'd be making uh, carbon filaments, we'd be getting dissolution through, uh, and this would be the process that we'd be expecting to occur. And precious metal catalysts, though, um, there isn't actually a very good literature for whisker carbon. There is some literature, but not very much. And we have looked in these systems with electron microscopy, and we can't see any whisker carbon. So we're not making the sort of classic filaments. What we believe we are doing is we're spilling over from the metal onto the support. And in fact, we have been able to see sort of graphitic carbon uh, produced on the surface of the support. Now, the other thing you may have noticed was that when we did this reaction, uh, we should get a ratio of, for every methane that we've reacted, we should get two hydrogens. Now, for the rhodium, uh, the hydrogen to methane reactive ratio is a little bit less than two, we're just sitting on two. It's perfectly okay. For the platinum, however, it's sitting uh, considerably above two. So we're going to ask ourselves, well, where is this extra hydrogen coming from? Well, we believe it's actually coming from the support hydroxyls. And we have a spillover situation where the carbon is reacting here, gives CO2, which is retained by the alumina, and hydrogen is given off into the gas phase. There is a difference here though, if you'll notice that the rhodium didn't do it, we think this is a function of particle size, because there's a considerable difference here, and it's really an interface effect that we're actually beginning to see uh, at this point. Remember, we're only doing pulses, you only see this in the early stages, you can't do this forever. Uh, you have got plenty of hydroxyls of pulse situation, when you go to a, a continuous flow or you continue to pulse it on, the hydrogen value decays back to two. So we're not trying to create mass. It is actually only a limited process at the very beginning of the reaction. So the continuous flow studies, these were done in T-ohm microbalance at 20 bar. For those of you, this is the T-ohm, with the catalyst sitting in here, it's supported, a loudspeaker, sensors, <coughs> and we flow the gas through um, and we take the element and we can measure the change in mass using this equation here. We've got standard methodology that we're using. We put in 30 milligrams of catalyst, we heat it to 600 Celsius, we juice it, purge, Methane at 20 bar for an hour, purge CO2 for 30 minutes, and then a further hour on methane. And part of this is to look and see if we separate these bits out, can we actually use this CO2 to clean any of the carbon off? Okay, well, let's just make sure that uh, at 20 bar, alumina still doesn't do anything. And here, You've got a typical trace. This is the weight under nitrogen. This is the weight under methane. The change here is due to buoyancy effects. When we change a gas in the T-ohm, the T-ohm senses the fact that there's different gas there. You could get a buoyancy change, so there's a step change. But you can see this is now flat. Uh, and this is saying that that methane is not doing anything at all. There's no mass change with the alumina. Okay, so we'll see these points. Say, the red lines in the following graphs will indicate where we've changed gas flows. Okay, the, this is the flow rate over here for the nitrogen and for the methane. So we've got 
So let's look at Rhodium. Unfortunately, this computer's a little bit slow, so it kind of builds it up in bits, but eventually we get to where we want to be. I've seen all the rest there anyway, but then. Anyway. Here we have nitrogen, we switch across to methane, and you can see we get the change buoyancy, and then immediately we start to get the mass increase. So we're starting to get a lay down of carbon over the course of the hour, uh, and you can see it's fast and decaying away, slowing down, as you would expect, as the catalyst can activate. If we then switch to nitrogen, we get a flat bit, as we expect. If we switch to CO2, it is also flat. There is no decrease here, so the weight of the catalyst is remaining exactly the same under the CO2. The CO2 is not removing any carbon from the surface. We switch back to nitrogen, you can see it's at the same level as this one here. And then finally, back to methane. And you see that that level is virtually the same as the level as you've got here. So by this point, we've pretty much deactivated the catalyst. And that difference here to here, that difference there, is a measure of the amount of carbon that we've actually laid down on the catalyst sample. We quantify that, it's about 1.2 mg. It represents a 4% increase in weight of a catalyst. So we'll start with 30 mg. Carbon to beta ratio is now up in the thousands, and you've totally saturated the system with carbon. If we look at platinum 1, we'll build it up in the same way. So again, we get the buoyancy effect, and then again, we get the increase in carbon as we go through. Again, faster rate slowing down as we get the increase. Nitrogen flattening off. CO2, again, not removing any carbon. And we'll go back to nitrogen. But this time, when we go back to methane, you'll see that we're still on a significantly rising and that just follows completely on from where we stopped. So we haven't totally deactivated this catalyst. This catalyst is still active. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, granted at quite a slow rate, but this is actually now subsettled down to quite a steady uh, rate of carbon laydown over the period. In this case, this is the value taken after the first hour, so it's comparable with the rhodium system. After the first hour, we've laid down 0.9, it's a 3% increase in weight. And this time, we're only at uh, sort of one and a half thousands to one. Uh, whereas with the rhodium, we were up nearly at 5,000 to one. So, conclusions. The spillover of the carbon allows the activity to be maintained far beyond monolayer coverage. Uh, if we didn't have that sort of spillover mechanism in the operation, the catalyst would be dead very, very quickly. The hydrogen produced right at the very beginning is from the support where the hydroxyls reacting, probably at the metal support interface. At high pressure, we get this reaction continuing really until we've saturated the support with carbon. So the support is almost your limiting factor in terms of how much carbon you can put onto the system. CO2 treatment doesn't remove. And we've got to be careful here. This could be just aged carbon on the metal or any carbon associated with the support. Um, we're going to do a little bit more work to be absolutely clear about whether this is an aging effect because we've had it for an hour or whether it's just because it's on the support. And finally, you can see that we've got platinum now with a, a lower rate of carbon down over a similar period under similar conditions. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. Please. <laughs> That you found that the CO2 does not remove the carbon formed in the methane uh, decomposition. Well, of course, we have to explain why the uh, 
methane, the dry deforming of methane on a rhodium producing so little carbon, relatively little carbon is being formed during the reaction compared to the other metals. And uh, because we had the same result and we assumed that when methane is activated on rhodium and CH3 is being formed, CH3 species reacts with carbon dioxide. And if so, it means that uh, the CH3 could be uh, <coughs> could enter reaction CO2 before it decomposes to carbon. And we prove this by also being CH3 and reacted with carbon dioxide. Yeah, uh, if I can, I think it's noticed that if you go to the uh, rhodium system, you'll notice that we didn't get a ratio of two out of the back end. And actually, we think that on that system, we're not actually getting carbon as C, as a CH species on the surface. So actually, I would agree with you wholeheartedly that it isn't probably reacting with carbon, it's reacting with a CH species. We couldn't say it's CH3, but I would go along with that quite happily. Please. Uh, Galen Fisher, Delphi. Uh, did you go on and say put some oxygen in or uh, some <laughs> hydrogen or something and see whether you could uh, remove this carbon uh, and uh, see the weight change uh, go back and some other things? I, I've got to say it wasn't our tail. Um, it's Johnson Matthews' tail. And we'd already broken it once. Uh, <laughs> because we tried the experiment that they preferred that we hadn't done. Uh, and we had a whole list of experiments and they sort of scored them off as saying too dangerous, too dangerous, too dangerous. And that was one of the ones that we got scored off our list. Um, part of it is the exotherm and various other aspects. They weren't keen that we did certain experiments that we would very much like to have done. But unfortunately, they felt that the TOM cost a lot more than a PhD student. You didn't even water it wasn't good. We, we didn't try water, no. Um, I mean, that, that was the other thing we would like to have done. The TOM itself wasn't set up to do steaming uh, in, in the mode it was operating in at, at that time because we needed heated lines to get steam. If I bought a TOM, it could do it though? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did I understand that you, you couldn't do the hydrogen uh, as well? You couldn't react with hydrogen in the DNA. Uh, we could have done hydrogen, yes. Uh, we did do hydrogen, um, not in the TOM, but in another system, and it was very unreactive. The carbon was very unreactive to the hydrogen. Yeah. Well, that was the question I had. Yeah. No. Because if, if if you do a temperature program reaction with hydrogen, you should be able to identify those carbons. Yes. Yeah. 